<laughs> Theories of Calderon is an epic fantasy book by the urban fantasy legend Jim Butcher. And I was really excited to get into this because for very obvious reasons, uh, I'm a massive Dresden Files fan. That has become quite well known here on the channel. The amount of you DMing me because you've picked up Dresden off my recommendation is coming close to rivaling that of the Wheel of Time. So, wow, good, good there. And I'm, I'm hoping Jim Butcher lives up to the legend. Why am I talking in future tense when I've already read it? It was good, but I had problems with it. And let's go ahead and dive into the Furies of Caldron review. That broke things. In a world where a ruler is pretty okay and everyone has elemental abilities depending on which kind of fury they have. Could be air, could be earth, could be fire, could be water. Scheming begins because there is no air to the throne. And as politics be doing, politics starts happening. That didn't make sense, but you know exactly what I mean. We follow a cast of characters that were really the shining beacon of this story. Amara, Tavi, Bernard, all of them were fascinating. And so if you are a character-based reader, I think Furies of Calderon is going to be a solid recommendation there. In fact, let's go ahead and out of 10 the crap out of this book. I'm going to out of 10 all the features because I want to explain myself well. And let's get into character deep dive here first. And we're going to talk about spoilers at the end. So if you're worried about spoilers, don't be because that's at the end. I think this is the first time I've worn a hat in a video and it's because my hair is doing weird things today. So just moving on. Really, the spotlight is shared equally in this story, but unlike a lot of epic fantasies where you're third person limited and jumping around from person to person to person, it's hyper, hyper focused for like chunks of the book on one character and then you will jump to another, which I actually found to be rather refreshing. It's a little obnoxious when sometimes fantasy authors just over jump between characters. Like I've seen examples of like the same scene is happening and you jump from one to another a lot in that don't like that. So it feels a bit slower there, and you feel like you get to know each character through their own phase uh, a lot better, which I enjoyed. So going over on basic premise, Amara is probably my favorite of the good guys, and her story begins with her trying to go through a final test to prove she can be a a black operative, a, a spy, a, a, an agent, an agent of the king. And without getting to spoilers yet, things go wrong, twists and turns happen, and she must prove herself while abiding by her rather stringent moral system, which is a cool type of character to have. It's actually like rare, uh, I find, for like the paladin moral type, and I mean by that someone who is lawful good all the way through, to be a central focus of a book like this. Usually you have characters who are more morally bendy, especially in the current state of fantasy, um, but no, Amara is someone more along the lines of like a lot of my audience will be familiar with, Galad, someone who sees the rules and wants them to be carried out to a T. And her growth and development, while well, she was obnoxious at first and not a character you like in the sense of like, let's go grab a beer. You still enjoy her as the premise and execution respectability in that sense. Uh, moving on to the other side, we have another character named Tavi. And this isn't necessarily a spoiler, but he's different because he doesn't have a fury, meaning he doesn't have access to the magical abilities available to these people. And I really like this alternative take on the chosen farm boy because he's not the clear center of everything. He's just like this kid in the background with a quirk who's pretty brave and kind of smart and overall, you know, you root for him. And that's just it though. Like, yeah, he's the quirky farm boy, but he doesn't steal the spotlight and the story is not his. This is not a chosen one, like as he's rising up to take the lead, it's just like a kid who's got a problem Maybe something's gonna come of it, we don't really know. We also have Bernard and Asana, and this is one of the few tropes of fantasy that Jim Butcher actually just kind of took in stride, didn't kind of change anything about it, and that is having like the, the good ruler, someone who's a kind uh, person in charge that you just like see them as this gentle man, you're like, I, I love you a little bit, you're wonderful. And while I typically am kind of going against tropes a lot right now, they've been grinding on me more and more recently, they were handled so well in the hands of Jim Butcher that I just ended up liking them a lot. They have the least arc, I would say, in terms of character development, but that doesn't mean Jim Butcher doesn't fully explore these two, and they bring a lot of personality to the pages as they are the more reasonable middle ground of good. Amara is kind of in that super stringent, everything must be done to the T kind of vibe, and then finally we have Tavi, who's kind of just Naive good, he's, he's a child, he's a young, young, young little tyke. But if we're gonna jump away from the good guys and talk about the bad, first we need to bring up Fidelius. Fidelius! 
Fidelius? Because I could not read his name without doing that. Every time the name Fidelius came off the page, I don't know why, I would just go, Fidelius! He was the best kind of villain because he is following a line of logic and reasoning that makes sense. He's more just an extremist, someone who's going too far instead of working within the established system. And that's why you're like, mm, okay, I hate you. I get you. You're not dumb. You're not ridiculous. And that's really a wonderful type of villain to exist in an epic fantasy world like this, especially with how much time is taken to really flesh him out and give limitations to his morality. Uh, unlike a couple other villains, let's talk about Kord. So we have like the big bad villain and that's where Fidelius' allegiances are at, like he's on that level. And then we just have bad people. Kord is a piece of shit. <laughs> Kord, one of those villains that you're like, wow, you might be the best written character of this story just because of how much I want to punch you in the face. I can recognize you're written extraordinarily well because I want to get into these pages and murder you. He's not a grand political scheming monster. He's a dumb brute who has too much power and he has a brood of brutes that were all morons and idiots and jerks and evil and you just have to like deal with their, their poisonous miasma in the pages and you're like, I I hate you. I want you to die. I'm so glad you're in this book because it's very compelling. So overall, I'm going to go ahead and say like character for Furies of Calderon is one of my favorite aspects of the story. I'll give it a very solid 7.5 out of 10. None of them are cracking my top 10 characters of all time, but they definitely have the potential for me getting much further in this series, maybe having them fall higher up in my ranks. It's unfair. It's only one book in, so I can't make the comparison to my favorites of all time but I like the foundations, especially from Amara. She is the one I'm most curious to see what her trajectory will go to, because I feel like she has the most to learn and change about. Well, let's swap it on over to Magic System because this is actually something I'm surprised I can have a problem with. Very cool on premise, but the biggest weakness of this first book for an epic fantasy series is the lack of explaining, which is gonna be something a lot of people like because a ton of people pick up Malazan, Wheel of Time, Song of Ice and Fire, Lord of the Rings, these big epic fantasy things, and they cannot stand the level of explaining that occurs within the pages. They just wanna to be told a story. And if you're that kind and you aren't actually like questioning and thinking about like the magic system a whole lot, this criticism is not really gonna to apply to you. I had an issue with how much I still don't understand and how much went unexplained as I read this book. You need to explain things to me, Jim. I need to be able to connect every dot. And there were quite a few dots unconnected when it came to the limitations, the origins and stuff for this magic system in the first book. Granted, I'm extremely prejudiced as a fantasy reader, wanting things explained to me early on so I can just get in the world, understand it and move through it. Oh, and the magic system on premise is, as I said, everyone has these abilities. They're various like elemental powers. Someone can have earth, someone else has wind, someone else has water, someone else has fire. And then they also kind of work to cancel each other out. Like air is canceled out by earth and things like that. It is an interesting magic system and was utilized to decent effect in the story, though I think it could have been taken to more extremes, but with how epic fantasy goes, I expect it to be taken to greater extremes in subsequent books. But now flipping over to world. Uh, magic system, I'm going to say, is like a 6 out of 10. It's very cool in premise. I'm just waiting to see more from it, and I'm a little unsatisfied there. World... I'm going to go ahead and label like a four out of 10 because we are introduced to a couple different kinds of cultures, uh, really like different like environments. And I never felt fully immersed in them. And this is actually where that continued lack of explaining is going to go into something I feel will be a more universal criticism because too much was left to me to interpret as the reader. I needed Jim to take a greater uh, level of effort to really put me in this world through atmosphere in greater detail didn't feel that as much as I wanted to. And I don't want to say something like I've seen a couple reviewers doing saying like, oh, clearly he's just used to writing urban fantasy in Chicago, so therefore he can't build this new world. Don't think that's necessarily true because there was a lot of really uh, wonderful world building done here. It's just like, it, basically it felt like someone sketched out the drawing of their world and then they got like 80% done painting it and then they were interrupted. And so there's still just like a little couple areas that are just the scaffolding of the painting to come and that rubbed me the wrong way. The Marat, I think that's how you say it, are a wonderful example. It's this whole new culture, system, lifestyle completely, and we spent a decent amount of time with this alternative people, but 
I'm never really understanding them or connecting with them. And I'm not trying to hold them up to the bar of the Dothraki or the Aeol or some culture that's painted to me that I'm, you know, uh, fully like those are the best of the best cultures fantasy has to offer. But even not comparing them to that, uh, I was left wanting. The prose is pretty typical for Jim. He doesn't seem to try and change it up too much uh, from Dresden, although while this one is not written in first person, which might be a jarring thing for uh, many Butcher fans because it's epic fantasy, and I think most people are going to be fine with that, and he handles third person quite well. I took a brief amount of time throughout the book to kind of just be like, how is he writing compared to his first person? And it's great. There's no real weaknesses to Jim's writing outside of just saying it's not very flowery, it's not very high prose, it's just average and solid. Now, finally, we have my two Ps here. We're going to have plot and pacing, and this is going to be two more extremes of this review you where the pacing oh no and I want to take a note to point at a couple critics who I see talk about this book because I'm tired of people saying like yeah the pacing was super slow and didn't have me invested at all for the first two thirds but because the last third was really fast and engaging I totally forgive that no <laughs> if the first two thirds of a book are too slow or not engaging enough due to the pacing that is a flaw don't forgive it just because suddenly at the end there's a big climax and a lot of action because books should be compelling from beginning to end. You don't need to excuse writers who fail to accomplish engaging momentum of story from first chapter to last. That is something that can be done and is a legitimate criticism. And I will say this suffers exactly from that where up until about maybe here, I was a lot colder on this book. This last amount was really action packed, but if you're someone who can't push through uh, a text to get to an ending, another big issue you might have. Although overall, damn that ending is good though. I'm not excusing the first two thirds being slow and kind of meddling and pacing, but goddamn that ending, that ending was good. That ending had me going. And now let's talk about plot, which is actually where I think this book shines the strongest. And while I had the issues I've brought up with uh, Furies of Calderon, I pretty much understand why this uh, is so praised because most readers care the most about character, which I said was really strong, and plot, which is also really strong. And so if you're able to kind of just not be bothered by these other things, you're pretty much good. And you'll probably be one of the diehard fans of this one here. Uh, but I didn't necessarily love those other elements, but talking about plot, this is a damn good plot. There is a wonderful blend of characters going on an adventure style storytelling where they're going through the wilderness trying to get to the next safe place as their enemies chase them. Loads of that, and that's usually like the strongest uh, character work there. But if you're more of a, I want to see the political maneuverings behind the curtain person, lots of that too. We are seeing how exactly these monumental world events that are occurring originate and then seeing the ramifications of those decisions trickle down to uh, the you know individual holdings of this world and all the way down to our characters experience the, experiencing those ramifications. So that was really nice. And I really actually admire a story that takes the time to show us from A to Z why is something occurring? And there was at no point when, you know, I was left asking a lot of questions with world and magic system, no questions remain for in terms of plot. And I also want to say that in terms of characters making decisions, uh, not just for plot convenience, because they are accurate to their character base, Totally. No character at any point did anything that to me uh, just felt like serving the plot. And even the villains, you know, if they're defeated by the hero in this story, it's not because they are suddenly being really stupid. It's because they're genuinely outsmarted or the hero does have to pay a hefty price to get out of the situation. So mm, all of that blends really, really well. Um, and I think also lends to why this uh, first Codex Alera book has such a positive reaction online. So overall, uh, for Furies of Calderon, I'm feeling a very solid high six, light seven out of 10. Uh, there's plenty for people to enjoy here. And while I don't think anyone's gonna say it's the greatest fantasy story ever told or totally flawless, um, it's charming and it's got basically the two most fundamental pillars for having a compelling narrative, which is a good plot with characters who feel realistic throughout it. So if you have not finished the book, I need to explain this because every other YouTuber does, but shouldn't I just be able to say spoilers now then jump into spoilers? Yeah, spoilers, get out. What I wanna talk most about here when it comes to spoilers is 
Amara. She was interesting for so many reasons from the beginning to end, and seeing her at the end of this story be a lot more confident in who she is and, you know, her decision making, because that's really what frees her a lot at the start of the story. By the end, it feels like a lot of those chains have been broken off from her, and she is still, uh, stands by her morals. She's not someone who's completely changed in an unrealistic fashion. Uh, she still has this rock solid bed of, I believe these things and I will fight for them and I won't compromise. Now it's someone who feels more human around there, less stiff in who she is. Now her relationship with Fidelius is kind of the best foil she could could have had, right? Someone who has kind of decided to go for their more self-interest based and okay, this is how I view the world and I'm gonna do whatever it takes extreme. Well, she is much more in this reserved, you know, I'm loyal, uh, I believe in the established system. And then that being the student of the person who went to the other side is just this great dynamic, right? Like that on loan, you have someone who's having to go against the person who taught them everything just because they have a key fundamental difference in who they are. And Fidelius's arc, well, he doesn't have a whole lot of one outside of, again, us just coming to understand him more as readers. But by the end, I understood him to the point where it was like an arc of understanding because I feel like I have a different understanding of who he is and why he's done what he's done at the beginning of the book. Obviously, I'm not saying like I'd be on Fidelius's side. People, whenever I say like, oh, the uh, villain is understandable, they'll say like, but they were awful. How could you possibly say that? I'm saying like their motives were clearly explained and were logical enough that like, yes, a, a person could believe that. But switching over to Cord, talk about a satisfying ending for a villain. F that dude so much. You hate him so viscerally by the ending of this book, having the conclusion it did where he is, he, people gonna eat him. <laughs> <laughs> just felt so right. And while typically I don't like having a villain die too early in the series because we still have Fidelius and everyone aligned on his side, having someone like Cord, whose just sole purpose is to be here and by the end of the book, give catharsis of some form to the reader, don't mind it because it's just, okay, I still am motivated and curious to go throughout, but you have this very believable, very well-realized villain for this one beginning and that's balance. And I'm also pretty happy that this book didn't go a route I was calling, which is having the king, the grand poobah, the guy who we're told is nice and doing the best he can uh, turn out to be bad. That didn't happen, and I'm glad because that would have been very predictable and like, ah, okay, now the, the good guys are going to not join the bad guys, but they're also not going to serve and they're going to start their... No, not at all. It's just he's genuinely a good king, good ruler, and we're okay with that. That, that felt different. In fact, that's actually something that stands out consistently in this book, is just some people in power are genuinely good. And a lot of fantasy stories refuse to have that actually be a thing. You know, they're constantly just everyone in power is evil and awful and bad, and the little guy's gonna rise up and take them down. Um, no, they were actually just presented as, okay, this is a genuinely good person who happens to be in power. Uh, I like that we see these hordes of monsters really do awful damage to the land, the people who are the protagonist, the good guys, and I thought Fidelius would then uh, chicken out, back down. Doesn't happen. You know, he stands by what he believes and he's well aware of the ramifications of his actions. I guess I was just like underestimating the narrative and it turned out it was a pretty damn good story, so I was proven wrong. Even that last scene with Fidelius landed quite well with me because it did feel a bit formulaic at the end of like, oh, okay, the climax is over, the protagonists unite and you know, oh, great, okay, and oh, we're showing the bad guy still got a thing. And then we have the one last little character, ha, send off. That, you know, I didn't love that literal exact formula being redone, but what was done with Fidelius was something that was pretty much shown to be happening throughout the book, and the fact that we just get to see the full scope of the situation where there are two knives at the king's back ready to go, and you feel like, oh, okay, yeah, definitely need to follow up, worth it, book two, because you've earned it. Fidelius seems dangerous, he's smart, and he's capable, but he really feels like someone who's just using people who are trying to use him. So there's this like setup in the antagonist side where it really shows like the ramifications of being willing to sell your morals down the river to accomplish a goal, and Fidelius just seems to be someone who's willing to make that sacrifice. Then you have like true, just unforgivable, bastard evil to compare him to with Cord, and I hate the guy. I hate him so much. But of course, if you'd like to check out this book for yourself, there's a link in the description down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Get ready for an Iron Druid Chronicles review coming down the road. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier Patreon, Jefferson Stockstill.
Thank you so much for the support, and I hope you're having a wonderful week.